Hey, do you teach yoga? Have you ever trained to lead yoga classes to be a yoga therapist? Have you ever owned a yoga studio? Maybe even just wondered what it was like for the women and men up there in front of the room on their mats, leading you through endless Surya Namaskars, down dogs, and pranayamas galore? Well, these are their stories and mine. I'm Rebecca Sebastian, a 20-year yoga teacher, 10-year yoga therapist, yoga studio owner, and co-founder of a yoga-focused nonprofit. I've done a lot in the yoga world over the last 20 years, pretty much everything except had a water cooler. You know, a place to share stories, talk about struggles, successes, and find other people who do the same thing that I do. Welcome to Working in Yoga, a podcast and substitute water cooler for yoga folks to connect and build community, to share our unique profession, our challenges, and our journeys with the world. Hey everyone, this week I am welcoming the fabulous Joe Bregnard to the podcast to talk all about self-care for yoga professionals. We often forget or gloss over the idea that yoga teachers need to figure out how to care for themselves as much as we are caring for our students. Now, I'm going to acknowledge that sometimes this is hard. There was a time when I was teaching 20 classes a week and driving everywhere and still barely making enough money to get by. And self-care was the last thing on my mind at that time. And honestly, the first tip that Joe gives us is one that I could have used at that time. So take a listen and stay tuned for all the pearls of wisdom that Joe gives us throughout the podcast. So I want to welcome my dear friend, Joe Bregnard, to the podcast today. She and I are going to be talking about self-care and yoga professional self-care for this entire episode because she is a pro at self-care. And when we started talking about self-care a few episodes ago, I knew I wanted to have Joe on because I know she's going to have so much insightful wisdom for us today. So welcome, oh, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I love just having conversations like this. And this is such a great topic. And it is, yeah, one of my passions. So thanks for inviting me. Me too. I'm like excited for our conversation. Will you tell us first about you and who you are and what you do and how you got into yoga? I will definitely do that. Yes. Um, I got into yoga regularly, I should say, because I dabbled for years and years, probably in the mid 2000s for I, what I think is the reason that a lot of people get into yoga, but I could be wrong. And that is um, as an athletic workout, you know, I was, it was another way for me to work out. And when I was in the thick of it, I was at my hot power, you know, yoga studio down the street from my work, um, sometimes twice a day, you know, really cranking it, these level two, three classes. That was, that was me. I loved doing all that stuff. Not that I could do all the fancy postures, but I liked the heat and I liked the quick pacing and all of that to, to really narrow down how I got into the self-care piece of it is um, my, I am a breast cancer survivor. So I went through breast cancer. My, um, shortly before then, my husband was severely injured um, at work, um, a burn injury. And I wasn't in the studio for a period of time. And when I went back, it was just nice to have a break in a place that was quiet and where I didn't have to think about changing dressings or making the next meal or who was coming over to visit or any of that stuff. And I really appreciated that. That was kind of my first little inkling into, oh, this is more than just moving my body around. Like it is okay. Cause we are always told, you know, if you take a break, come down to your mat, you know, if you just need to sit during class. And I took advantage of that during that time. But really then my husband was, um, had some severe heart issues in the mid 2000s. Um, and then shortly thereafter that my mom was diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's disease that I had this other reason to come back to the mat. And my, my practice became a lot less about postures and a lot more about being still and listening and being open and, and quiet and sitting and all the other pieces that a yoga practice can provide. And that's when it came to me that, Oh, I have to take care of me. You mean, no, no, I take care of everybody else. And, and it's hard. It's hard to make that shift. Yeah. Right. Yes. I think, 
I, I think yoga folks as a profession, we tend to be those givers. We tend to be those people who like to care for other people. And we forget sometimes that we count just as much as everybody else in the room. Yeah. I mean, I use the example sometimes like those new teachers who come through and every time they practice, they're thinking about their regular students. And I'm like, I did that too at first too, going, oh, I want to make sure that, you know, Bob and Mary and Sue all have their best practice. But then my practice wasn't in service of me. It mm. was in service of them and still using yoga as a way to give and give and give instead of using it as a way to fill my cup up. Right, right. And yeah, you you count. You are one of those people in yes. the room that have an equal stake in what's going on, you know, in the container of that practice. So oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. I... What's one tip you give to yoga pros to help care for themselves? You know, one of my favorite ones is saying no. Yes. <laughs> I'm saying yes to you saying no. Ooh, good one. <laughs> no, no, say no. <laughs> yeah, I, we, especially as yoga teachers, want to grab every opportunity and, you know, oh, there's so many directions we can go in this. Cause then there's a, a whole mindset shift about, you know, lack and abundance and things like that. But, um, you know, because we feel that we can help everybody and we, we can help a lot of people. And so we want to take every single opportunity that's brought before us, no matter how far we might have to drive in the before times or in the to come times, or, you know, how many props we have to lug ourselves because the space doesn't have props or how we don't have to take any payment because I'm just going to serve these people. <sighs> Separate topic, right? You know, yes. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, we, we overlook all of that stuff and we say, um, you know, I'm, I'm just going to make this work and the other opportunities present themselves when we say no. So I have, I just realized that this great example of this. So I moved to Vermont full-time during COVID was planning on doing it anyway. It just so timed out that way. Um, we moved to our, like our weekend place that, uh, and, and retired from our full-time jobs. Um, and so we had been in this place for 10 years, familiar with the area and everything. So a couple hours North of here, there's an Island, a tiny Island, um, in Lake Champlain that, uh, has 10 or so houses on it. Um, it's obviously just a summer place. That's all that's on it. There's no facilities or anything on it. You have to get, obviously get there by boat. And I, my family, when I lived, this is right near Burlington. When I lived in Burlington, my family came to visit and stayed in a, in a cup, one of these homes. Um, and it was really fun, you know, cookouts on the beach and the whole thing. So, um, I've been following them on social media and they've been following me and they said, Hey, would, would you, when as things open up, would you do a retreat here? Wouldn't that be great? And I said, Oh my gosh, that'd be awesome. You know? And, <laughs> and so now, meanwhile, this was in February, we were talking about this maybe. And now I had no idea we'd even be where we are right now in terms of opening. And, um, my mind just started going and I thought there's no food out there. I'm not even sure that there's a building where we can practice inside if the weather's not good. Like, you know, as, as you plan yeah. events, you have to think of all the contingencies and I'm thinking of them. And I thought, and it's a two, two plus hour drive for me so to even like check out or get things set up. And I want, I was like pushing this and wanting this and wanting this. And then I just said, I think I need to step back. And, you know, we know people uh, um, in our, in our group, in our um, business coaching group that live right there. And I said, this is an opportunity to pass on to somebody else who lives right there. I mean, there's still those things that need to be planned and will be challenging. But when you live 20, a 20 minute drive from the dock, it's a lot simpler. And I said, I, you know, not it's, and it's not necessarily no, it's just not right now. Yeah. And that's okay. Cause it could be next year, you know? And then it just felt so good to let that go, you know? Yeah. That is such a good tip. Like seriously, listeners, if you get anything out of this, saying no as a yoga professional 
is self-care. You can't say yes to everything. I mean, I was joking the other day. I have a, a teacher who just learned that she's expecting. And I was telling her when I was pregnant with both my kids, I was teaching between 18 and 24 classes a week. Oh. And I just didn't say no. And it's that like I look back now and I'm like, that was insanity. I didn't have to say yes to all those things, but at that time, there was also nobody telling yoga professionals, A, that you can say no, and B, that you can say no strategically because that leaves you open to say yes to something else that's more meaningful. Right. And that's so true. So very true. Yeah. I'm I so think, glad you said that. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I think, you know, things have changed a little bit now that a, a lot of us are online or, or we're more online. Um, but I, as things again have opened, I've seen some of the teachers who aren't so much online go back into their pattern of yeah. driving everywhere and teach because um, they're able to, you know, they kind of waited and jumped in when as things open to say, yes, yes, I'll be the first one to, to teach there. And you know, too, those tend to be the teachers that don't um, niche down as much. Like they don't, yes. they are doing everything. I'm doing all kinds of yoga because I can teach this kind and that kind. And um, yes, you can. Is it what lights you up though too? Yeah. Oh, know? yes. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Can we talk about niching down as being a form of self-care for yoga professionals? Because, yeah. oh, isn't it just like the minute you decide who you want to teach isn't life just more magical? <laughs> yes, really it's is. like a big weight gets lifted off. You like you mean I don't need to, even though I took the prenatal class, I don't need to teach because that's not my jam. Like I I know how to teach you, but I don't even have that experience. I've not had children of my own, but I know how to teach you. But you know what? I really have experience with taking care of other people as I'm trying to take care of myself at the same time and fitting in a practice and what my practice needs to look like to fully support me. So yeah, to be able to talk to the people that understand me that I understand and not, and have other people take care of the people yes. that I, you know, yeah, yes. it's good. Okay. So I need to have you back on here in the future for us to talk about scarcity and abundance because that is yes. an entire podcast episode. Yes, for sure. <laughs> I know. Well, this is, you know, the whole everything is connected. That's why all these things are coming up. So it's perfect. It's true. It's true. It's true. Okay. So give us another gem. Saying no. What else? Well, so, you know, that's a, that's a big thing for well, for everybody, but for yoga teachers, yeah. that's, that's a big, hard thing to do. And that's a, that's a kind of push away thing. I, I think the idea too, of, um, taking in experiences, I think we were talking, yeah, we were talking about this before you pushed to record taking in yeah. experiences that aren't necessarily associated with the main thing that you do, which is probably yoga. And in my membership that I have, um, my group meets uh, once a month and we just have a, an hour kind of chit chat and it's based around a theme and our chit chat coming up uh, next month is on inspiration. And I want it to be a show and tell. And I just am having the members bring whatever things around them, inspire them. And I don't want it to be like, I like this. I like this. I like this. I'd like to hear the story behind it. I want everybody to be able to hear each other's stories. So I told them they can invite special guests if it's a person or bring an animal on the screen or share artwork, do, like I'll turn over hosting. And so it'd be really fun. So I'm starting to take the time to find things around me to that feel good to me. And I have this green, this electric green blanket that I bought at a rummage sale that is really fuzzy that I love. And it's usually in this room. It's starting to get to not be blanket season anymore, but, um, and my cat loves it too. And it is just, whenever I see this blanket, like my stress level just goes right down because it is the thing that I want wrapped around me when I'm in yoga nidra or when I just need a snuggly nap because I'm not feeling good. And my cat just is always on it. I have it on my desk so he can lay on it. And when I'm working, he can sit <laughs> next to me. But if you can find some things around you, if you're just having a day where you're like, I, I can't do self-care today. Self-care is not happening today. You can find 
ways to build it into your day that don't require a break. And just having an object to look at. I really like the, the sensation of touch. It, I, it connects with me really well. You know, I, I love feeling tree bark or stones that I pick up. Um, if there are things like that that resonate with you that you can have around you um, so that you can tap into them quite literally or touch them or look at them or put on a piece of music when you need a little something during the day, those are great tools to take advantage of. And some of that for me comes out of this time when I was caring for my mom that I was driving back and forth. It was about two and a half hours each way. Um, there were a couple of times I'd be on my way back and my dad would call me and uh, well, I'll, you know, I'm almost home. I'm going to have to come back tomorrow. Um, and I just had no time for myself. And I was trying to, cause I was, you know, big yoga person, find stu yoga studios <laughs> to go to, to take a class and, you know, stop it. Like, that's not going to happen. I need um, a little bit of, you know, moments of downtime. And that's where I started to build some of these in while I was sitting in my car before I'd run into the grocery store or whatever. Maybe there, there are some things like that, that you can work into your life um, to take care of yourself. Ooh, yeah, I love that. Because I, I mean, and I tell the teachers who work here at the studio that too, like you are worth taking a minute. Like, oh, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just, you're giving it to everybody else. So you can't yes. do it yourself. You just can't. Yes. This is you, you have to, that has to be balanced. I mean, we have such an intimate job that we do. And this has been something I've been talking about with my staff and just in, in my community of saying yoga is different because there's an intimacy to our job that is not the same as if you were a personal trainer or you worked maybe in some sort of other sphere where you were teaching people how to move their bodies. Mm -hmm. There's an intimacy because it's not just the physical asana, because we're sharing our lives, because we're sharing a lifestyle practice and all these other things that, that can take that, that, drains our well a little bit and we have to fill our own wells back up because it's not always being of service to other people because eventually your well dries up and you, eventually yeah. you can't give any more yeah. and then you get burnout yeah. then you have teachers who are like i can't do this isn't sustainable I can't do this forever. Exactly. And resentment, right? Like then yes. people just push, push away. I do, you know, it burned me out. I don't want to do that practice anymore. It took so much of a toll, but we have so many choices, right? We really do have to look at these things as choices. And if, and we can decide to run ourselves into the ground. And, and certainly there are times when you might choose that if it's a, acute situation, you, you know, yeah. I, I'm always going to go back to the caregiving um, side of things. You know, you have somebody in the hospital, you have somebody, um, you need to step up for a neighbor because they have a, you know, personal situation going on. You can do that for a couple of days, but as days stretch into weeks to months, you know, yes. and again, you're not seeing an end to that. It's just not good. And, you know, and, and to, to, to impart that on somebody else, all you can do is is share that with them and and hope that they make choices that support themselves as well, right? It's hard to watch. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we matter too. Like what we do is so powerful and what we share with other humans, like we know this. I've been talking now in all these podcasts where people are so passionate about yoga and what we do is a real, it was gifted to us and we can gift it to other people. And it's, but we matter too. Right? Yes. yes. We, we have to matter too. And I, you know, I like that you started off this conversation without even this question because I, and I know it's because you assume it already and we've talked a little bit about it, but that hello yoga teacher, you are a caregiver. You know, I, I struggle so much in using that word because people push away from that word because they think it, it means strictly family, uh, you know, taking care of a, a family member that's ill. And it does include that. It includes healthcare people, includes teachers, it includes parents and yoga teacher, it includes school teacher, I meant to say, but yoga teacher 
for the reasons that you mentioned, the intimacy, um, especially, and, you know, whether you're in a group situation, which has different dynamics than a working one-on-one -on -one with somebody, uh, there are so many levels that you are, you know, putting your needs aside for a time to hold space for that other person. So, um, yeah, consider yourself a caregiver that needs all of the support that any other type of family caregiver, whatever, would need as well. Oh my gosh, I love that because that's one of the reasons I started this podcast is that I feel like we have nowhere to go as yoga people. We have very little discussion amongst us about how to truly and deeply care for ourselves. I mean, we sort of throw around, um, I think, the cheapened version of what can be really great self-care terminology like, because I'm a big advocate of self-care and I know you are too. Also, you all should follow Joe on Instagram. She's amazing. Oh, <laughs> Joe Bre at Joe Bregnard. <laughs> like <laughs> she has amazing self-care tips. And, but we don't have collective community discussions about how to care for ourselves. I mean, and I had said this before we pressed record, I was on this yoga teacher conf last weekend asking yoga studio owners if they had a hobby and it was crickets. Like, so and, and they laughed because, you know, I can sell things in a funny way, but also seriously take up underwater basket weaving or something that Anything. means that you're a whole human being that exists outside of all of this. You know, okay. yoga can be your business and yeah. your practice, but it's not your hobby. You have to be, yeah. Go. If somebody told me that, sorry, I'm like, ah, I, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. if somebody told me this, and I think I probably did hear people say this sort of thing before, or, you know, that there's more to life than yoga and that sort of thing. No, there's not, you know, um, it's, it's everything. And yes, yeah. you know, there is, and, and that's a the beautiful thing about yoga, right? There's so many pieces and parts to it and you can go down the philosophy side of it, or you, if you want to get very physical, you can go down the asana side, what, whatever, there's lots of different parts to it. But, um, this is some of what we were talking about previously too, that there's so much inspiration that can be gained from outside the studio. And if yes. we only stay in the studio or on our Zooms or only following just yoga teachers and uh, only taking classes just in um, something to help us uh, better ourselves as teachers and not anything else, we're missing out on so much. Um, and that's sad to me too, yeah. you know? You know, because I think we can bring in um, the inspiration from some of these, these other things as well, whether, you know, my, if it's traveling or, um, you know, I really enjoy gardening and I too spend a lot of time in the kitchen processing the stuff that we've grown in our garden and we have pet cows. So there's, you know, property, um, st things to look up and learn about and our shipment of bees, honeybees is coming in a couple of weeks. So yeah, you know, cool. and sometimes I'm like, why do I have so many things that I enjoy doing? You know, it's hard, but, and it can be because you also don't want to make those other hobbies work because that's not what they are. They should be fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they bring something to your practice and to your teaching that you can't get just inside the studio too. Yeah. I feel like that, you know, you remember that hashtag and it's still floating around on Instagram, but a couple of years ago, yoga every damn day yes. that really was like encouraging us yoga folks to do this, to do hard physical asana and practice your yoga every single day. And it made for very, I think, tunnel vision oriented yoga folks that weren't rich in depth and knowledge from other things. And then it became when we were having all these discussions in the yoga world about uncomfortable things, you know, how we're cultural appropriation and social justice, that we had a whole bunch of people who had not seen the outside world for so long that those conversations were really uncomfortable. And I think it just makes us a richer community when we're able to care for ourselves based on having hobbies and, you know, saying, I'm going to take five minutes to touch that favorite piece of bark or rock, like you were saying, or your magic blanket that you have that you wrap around yourself. Like that just gives us more depth and, I think that makes yeah. that's as much a part of our yoga practice as anything else. 
Ding, ding. Yes. I was going to say that, you know, we all know and teach and learn that yoga is uh, much more, you know, take the yoga off the mat. It's much more than the time that's in the studio. So while you're doing anything else in this world, you know, what lessons are you bringing from the mat? What lessons are you taking back to the mat? And yeah. In order, you have to get out of the studio or off the mat in order to do some of that. And, you know, I was thinking this morning as I was waking up and I knew we were going to have this conversation. So it's been a crazy uh, full moon week, I think, for a lot of us and, uh, in many different ways. <laughs> and that's probably a whole other podcast topic. I just got off a clubhouse session talking about some of the stuff that ha has happened with me. But, you know, I thought about what are the ways that... I'm taking care of myself today. I did one thing that happened to me yesterday was I recorded a class and must have turned my camera on and then off again and recorded a whole uh. class um, on Chaturanga, which is not my favorite posture, but the way that I would teach it and practice it and tips I would give to somebody, but still so physically, you know, very focused on that. I realized that the camera wasn't on. And so I need <laughs> to get this done. So I taught it again, making sure that the camera was on, but you know, my body, I'm feeling it today. And, and Thursdays are a long day. Anyway, it's, um, I teach and then I take a meditation class late into late for me into the evening. I call my dad bookend morning and afternoon to, you know, check in on him. So Thursdays are just a long day for me. And I look forward to a Friday, which is sort of a down day for me doing mostly sitting down work and clean up. Um, and, and then sort of also taking like a half a day for myself. Um, and that is part of my self-care. And I knew that today I, you know, the, the sun came up, I don't set an alarm, but I looked at the time and normally I would get up and come upstairs and I do a mixture of things, journaling, moving, um, uh, seated meditation, um, just whatever. I might, I, I really have uh, allowed myself to be free during that time and, and do what feels best for me. But I said, you know what? I'm damn tired. I'm going to loll in bed. I taught on pandiculation yesterday. So I'm going to, you know, full body yawn and stretch for about 10 minutes here. And then I'm going to get up because I did two, at least two days worth of stuff, movement and mental stuff yesterday, you know? Um, yeah. And then as the day goes on, you know, different things will filter into my, to my day in terms of, um, you know, is this practice because there is really no beginning and end to that. Um, but yeah, you know, I think to be a little kind to yourself when it comes to some of that stuff, because I do appreciate the tapas um, idea and discipline and some of that, but you got to listen. You know, we tell our students that all the time. You got to listen to how you, you're feeling, you know? Yes. And without guilt, the, yeah. the amount of guilt that has been handed to us as yoga professionals about if we've practiced that day, was your practice long enough? And I remember those days of going, oh my gosh, I only practiced 40 minutes today. <laughs> and I laugh and I'm just now having been, you know, 10 years gone from that time when I really was counting my minutes of how long I was on my mat at home and if it counted like church or something, you know, <laughs> and, and like, but I, I realized how much guilt we hand each other over this practice that's really designed to make the other 23 hours of the day better. Like we have that hour practice so that the other 23 are really great. So we can make better decisions. So our bodies feel better. So our minds are clear, like all these benefits that we know from our personal experiences and science. Thank you, science that happen. Mm -hmm. We have handed people guilt about the other 23 hours if that one hour isn't, quote unquote, enough. That's and right. self-care is just learning, how, like you said, learning how to say no, learning how to say, you know what, my body's sore today because I did a lot of chaturangas yesterday. So I am not going to do too much of a physical practice today. My practice is rest. Right. Right. And, you know, the other um, part of all of that is social media too, right? We look at social media and we see other teachers doing certain things, posting on their practice and how amazing that they've done certain things. And 
Yeah, you know, we t- and we know about social media that what we post is the the best looking stuff and all the um, yes. the perfect stuff. And yeah, you know, that's that's part of what I'm trying to do too is to to say to people, you know, it doesn't always look like that. And and no. you know, my word for the year, I try to pick a, a word or a theme for the year. My word for the year was was ritual, and I was really trying to come into these very. Um, focused practices for the morning and evening. And they actually worked out really well during the darker times of the year, um, which are tend to be quieter and the days are shorter. um, And we were really inside then, but as the weather has gotten warmer and, and what's tugging at me is to be at, first of all, just be outside, be in the outdoors, but also my garden time and taking care of flowers and, and all that stuff. And it just came to me that, you know, okay, so you can shit like the earth and the world and the seasons shift. You can yes. shift too. Things can shift for you too. Um, and again, like I said, I, you know, tapas, I, I appreciated and I, I, people who do certain, you know, the same thing for a certain number of days in a row, I give them so much credit. Um, and the, for right now, for me today, you know, that, that feels very constrictive to me. And I appreciate the freedom that I have, you know, a lot of things have changed in my life. Um, I retired from my full-time job and I'm doing, I don't know what else to call it. My, I ret- retired from my other job because, and now I'm, <laughs> I keep calling it that, but, um, and moved, you know, a lot of things have changed. And what I wanted to experience was freedom. That was one of the words in um, our, our business training that we've done together, Rebecca and I, that, that came up for me was freedom and flexibility. And so, you know, gift yourself that too, if that's what's important to you. If structure is what you yes. need and what you appreciate, then do that too. I'm not saying that, you know, one thing is right or wrong for anybody, but to find your thing, you know? Yeah. 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 Okay. So one final quick and dirty self-care tip before we go, Joe, what do you got? Uh, you know, I talked about a it. lot. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, just, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I mentioned it already, but getting outside and, you know, yes. we're Northern hemisphere right now. It's, it's a little easier to do. It's warmer and, and things like that. Um, but like putting your face in a window, if it's the dreariest day ever, or you're in the Southern hemisphere and it's cold, um, getting sunlight on your face, on your skin, on your eyeballs, on your closed eyelids. Um, and again, it can just be for a few moments or while you're grabbing a bite to eat. Um, the, you know, if you can spend more time outside, if you can, pra- I just love practicing outside and, you know, walking and all of that sort of thing. But, um, in those, those moments that you can be in nature and recalibrate will, that's exactly what happens will really, um, affect you in a positive way quickly. I think, you know, we, we went this whole time and didn't even use the B word for, um, baths, you know, everyone in self-care, I have to take a bath, you know, (laughs) chocolate or nails, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, nails, really? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, Not for me, for you. If it's your thing, go for it, but it's not my thing. Um, but that's it. And everybody has their own thing. That's that works for them. So Yeah. yeah, but I like the outside. Yes, me too. I'm with you. I love the outdoors. That's why I live in the Midwest. We have access to a whole lot of nature. So it makes me excited. Yeah. And so really quick, tell people where to find you so that they know. Yeah, you said it. I'm on Instagram at Joe Bregnard, J-O-B-R-E-G-N-A-R-D. Facebook. Um, I'm on Clubhouse. You can be on Clubhouse too now, Rebecca, if you want to be. (laughs) Um, It's open to Android (laughs) now. Um, and yeah, that's where I am. And you, uh, if you go to any of those places, you can get to my website. I have a free five day self-care mini retreat. There are little practices like this that you can do in between classes, you know, just little ideas for, for things. It doesn't need to be a whole big hour long something. It really doesn't. No. Thank you so much, Joe, for coming on the podcast. Make sure that you find her on Instagram at Joe Bregnard. 
J-O-B-R-E-G-N-A-R-D, or on Facebook or Clubhouse, which you also can find me on at Rebecca Seb Yoga is my handle. Next week is a solo episode, so it's just me, and I'm talking about something that I have been speaking to people about so much over the last few months that I decided to make a podcast all about it, and it is about how we sell yoga as yoga professionals. So stay tuned and don't forget to hit subscribe from wherever you're listening.